Craft brewing is a contemporary phenomenon, Tapland's listener. And for the most part, you're right. The commercial production of full-flavored beers in the United States really only hit its mainstream stride over the past, you know, decade and a half or so. But the movement, such as it is, dates back much further. Past the first boom and bust cycle at the turn of this century, past even 1978's federal green light on homebrew, which we talked about in a recent episode with the delightful Charlie Papazian. You go check that one out if you haven't. But today we're talking about something that happened even earlier than that. By most estimations, the American craft brewing milieu actually began in earnest in the early 60s when a young manufacturing scion from the Midwest found himself in San Francisco savoring the rich, malty flavor of draft beer, the likes of which he'd never tasted before. He was hooked. So in 1965, when he heard the brewery that made this so-called steam beer was about to go bust, he seized the opportunity. The man in question was Fritz Maytag. The beer, you know know as Anchor Steam. Under Maytag, the Steam Beer Brewing Company, as it was then called, would become a veritable laboratory not just for the beer, which was in desperate need of quality control, but also for the very business model of marketing and selling unique, locally made, small batch product to a public bombarded by national commodity brands at every turn. Today on Tap Lines, we're joined by Dave Burkhart, a three decade employee of that iconic Bay Area brewery and the author of The Anchor Brewing Story, America's first craft brewery and San Francisco's original Anchor Steam Beer. It's Anchor Steam, it's brewery historian emeritus Dave Burkhart, it's how Fritz Maytag got this whole craft beer thing going, and it's all right here, right now, on Vine Pairs Tap Lines. We are in for a real treat today, Tap Lines listeners. Joining the show uh, after a little bit of back and forth, and we were finally able to get him, uh, get some free time in his schedule to get him to come aboard is none other than Dave Burkhart. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And anytime I get to talk about beer, of course, means I have to I have to be drinking beer. So so that that's a perfect uh, perfect excuse. Fantastic. There we go. <laughs> and of, and of course, for those that can't see because uh, they're listening rather than watching, uh, Dave is right now pouring none other than Anchor's Liberty Ale. Dave. Uh, joins us from uh, the Bay Area of California, and he's here today to talk about um, a very special brewery. Uh, that's the Anchor Brewing Company of San Francisco, of Potrero Hill, uh, more specifically, and and its seminal, pivotal role in uh, catalyzing and kicking off what would later come to be known as the craft brewing revolution by many in this country. Dave, you spent uh, uh, north of three decades at Anchor. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that makes it sound really long when you say it in decades. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a lot of beer. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of beer. It's a lot of beer and a lot of coming years. and going. Yes, yeah. right. That's right. Um, and what were you when you started at Anchor? What was your what was your first job there? I was hired uh, May 20th, 1991, and in those days, everybody that got hired was interviewed by Fritz Maytag himself, and um, uh, everybody went right to the bottling line. Um, We were all trained in those days to basically do anything and everything at the brewery. I was the 35th person on the staff at that time. So it was still pretty, pretty small and pretty amazing group of people that, uh, and if you didn't know something, you ask. And um, if you didn't think you could pick up something because it was too heavy, you ask. So, uh, uh, so little by little, um, started in the bottling line, starting in the racking room, filling kegs, and, uh, and also start giving tours. It's a tradition. It's always been a tradition that the real people who really work at the brewery, you know, come up and give a tour after they're in their, uh, uh, yeast colored, uh, uh, colored, uh, coveralls, um, <laughs> and, uh, tell the, tell the story of anchor. And if you're smart, uh, and you don't know the answer to something, you don't make it up. You ask, ask a brewer, ask somebody that's been there longer than you, and they'll tell you the answer. And, uh, uh, so it's been a fabulous, uh, fabulous ride, and um, um, I couldn't imagine a better, uh, better way of spending thirty years of my life. 
Right on. And you just recently uh, took a well-deserved retirement, I think, just the end of this past year. And we, as we were talking before uh, before we started recording here, just catching up a little bit, you told me the title uh, that you sort of came out, uh, you, got, you came up with as sort of a way to contextualize the, the, the swan song or the capstone project that you did at Anchor, which of course was writing uh, a, a vital tome called The Anchor Brewing Story, America's First Craft Brewery and San Francisco's Original Steam Beer. Uh, you, you called your, your role on that project as Brewery Historian Emeritus. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And I say <laughs> I added Emeritus to it. Uh, my title's been Brewery Historian for a long time, but I added Emeritus to it, obviously, after I retired, mm-hmm. uh, primarily so people wouldn't hit me up for free beer anymore. <laughs> Yeah, the the tap has finally uh, closed. Someone else is it is, is manning yeah, the stick at this point. <laughs> exactly, it hasn't run dry for me, as you can as you can see. But it it's uh, um, people literally friends of mine. Literally on Friday, we get a case a week every Friday, and um, um, and I would just keep it in the trunk of my car. And, yeah. and uh, I can confess now that I no longer work for the brewery that I didn't really drink a case a week, but, uh, uh, so, you know, which is okay. <laughs> and which is why I'm here today with you. That's right. And, uh, uh, so, uh, but people started to know. So on Fridays, uh, if I was playing a gig, I play the trumpet. If I was playing a gig or something like that, they, they'd always, you know, put their arm around my shoulder and say, Hey Dave, let me walk you to the parking lot. It's not safe here in San Francisco, you know? And, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, and then I'd open my trunk and hand him a six pack. So it yeah. was a great, it was a great thing and a great fun and free beer, of course, are the two most beautiful words in the English language. Amen to that. And we, we certainly, that is, uh, that is a house policy here at Von Pears Tap Lines. We agree with that message wholeheartedly. We're non-denominational, but that's the closest we get to religion here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Well, I'm in church more often than I should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, <laughs> sir. Uh, Dave, again, thank you so much for being on the show. As I mentioned, listeners, just moments ago, uh, Dave authored, uh, the Anchor Brewing Story, which is um, a comprehensive, uh, you know, I've got it right here. He's got one on his, look, see, we're, we're book buddies. Uh, it's really fantastic. I enjoy, oh, yeah, I mean, the work was just, you know, so thorough. And we're here today to talk about just a small portion of what you cover in the book. So I do encourage anyone who's, who's interested in American beer history, Anchor specifically, the rise of the slow food movement. I mean, there's so many themes that sort of weave into um, Anchor's long, long tenure as, uh, uh, you know, San Francisco's brewery. But today we're here to talk about um, uh, the early days of Anchor's, what we, I suppose we would call maybe the second act. I mean, I'm generalizing a little bit, but um, many craft beer enthusiasts here in 2023 um, are at least vaguely aware that Anchor has played a important part in catalyzing the the craft brewing movement, such as it was. And I talked before a moment ago about how you know seminal and pivotal that role was. Um, we're talking specifically uh, about the moment in you know sort of 1965 and and the period directly before and, and directly after when Anchor Brewing um, you know sort of was saved from the jaws of defeat by a man that is synonymous with the company and, and has been ever since um, by Fritz Maytag who was uh, was your boss and was a longtime uh, uh, personal colleague and friend of yours, I believe. And, um, Fritz still is, yeah, still is. And, absolutely. And, uh, and God bless him. And so, you know, in 1965, Fritz, uh, was able to acquire the anchor brewing company and what happened in, you know, the, the decades to follow has been well-documented. Um, you know, there's starts to be sort of a broader interest, uh, in, in full flavored beer. Jimmy Carter, of course, signs, uh, into law, um, the uh, the uh, Cranston uh, bill. Thank you, the Cranston yeah. bill. Yep, that uh, allows home brewing at a federal level, and and of course the home brewers would go on to fight for it at the state level. And listener, please go back and check out uh, our episode with Charlie Papazian uh, to to hear more about that. But um, I think less is known, um, less is documented about that immediate aftermath when. Fritz Maytag now has control of the Anchor Brewing Company, and um, as you 
yourself have documented, maybe better than anyone else uh, out there. Um, those early years were were wild and chaotic because he kind of, charitably speaking, didn't really know what he had gotten himself into, maybe a little bit. And so <laughs> I want to, I would, I think we would, you know, uh, everyone would benefit, myself, our listeners, uh, from from talking through those heady times, no pun intended, um, as you know, if the Maytag era begins uh, on Potrero, Potrero Hill, and uh, and and what happens next. So we'll take us to 1965, Dave. If if you wouldn't mind, uh, can you give us a little bit of a run up on how exactly Fritz first became interested in in Anchor Brewing as a as a going concern? Sure. And once he bought it, he used to say, uh, we've got the world by the tail. The world just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and actually, uh, uh, the, br- the brewery became almost a laboratory for his, for his experiments. And there were no rules. And uh, it, he was flying under the radar for many years. Um, took him 10 years to turn a profit. Mm. Um, but I should back up and tell you a little bit of, of the prehistory. Of course, the history of Anchor Thanks, goes all the way back to the gold rush days uh, when a German uh, carpenter named Gottlieb Breckel arrived in late 1853, 1854 during the gold rush. Um, and uh, uh, he owned several breweries. And uh, in 1871, bought a beer and billiard saloon on Russian Hill um, that was called and named it uh, the Golden City Brewery. And over the years, that was on Pacific Street between Larkin and Hyde. Over the years, until the earthquake and fire of 1906, that was the location of our of our brewery. The name changed several times. Uh, the owners changed several times. Uh, but I like to think of September 18th, uh, 1871 as our founding date, our brewversary, whatever you call it. We're going to fast forward uh, through the earthquake and fire, uh, after which the uh, brewery moved south of Market Street um, in what's called Soma, uh, for obvious reasons, and uh, um, and it's been there ever since. It's bounced around from several different locations. Um, there's been a lot of catastrophes over, over the years, fires and earthquakes and bankruptcies and insolvencies and death and destruction. But I try not to focus on that uh, <laughs> as best I can, because if I do, I'll, I'll have couple of these. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, instead, I try to focus on Anchor's amazing resilience. The fact that at every turn, it seems like Anchor was about to just disappear. And with it, uh, it's uh, now world famous uh, Anchor Steam Anchor Steam beer. Um, steam beer was a beer uh, that uh, came out of the gold rush days uh, when German brewers were trying to make lager beer uh, under primitive conditions and without ice. Ice was very dear in those days. You could get, maybe get it from Sitka or from Boston, you know, mm-hmm. packed in sawdust and brought around the horn. But um, um, And it wasn't available. You say, might say, well, what about the Sierras? Well, the railroads weren't wasn't complete. Mm. Uh, a Transcontinental Railroad wasn't complete until 1869. Right. So, uh, uh, so they impro- so they improvised and uh, um, came up with this magical beer that, for in several different ways, nobody knows for sure, including Fritz and myself, uh, why it developed the nickname Steam Beer. There's several theories, uh, which I can go into if you want. But the uh, uh, the fact of the matter is. Um, there was no traditional lager uh, in California because yeah. of that lack of ice, because the fact you couldn't, there were no uh, alpine caves, of course, in San Francisco. <laughs> there were, and, couldn't uh, sell you know, them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Although the average temperature during the gold rush days, the mean temperature, I should say, was 56 and a half degrees, so a little cooler than it is today. Uh, that's not a traditional lager t- lagering temperature at all. And if they'd put the beer uh, down in the cellar and left it for two or three months, it was most certainly spoiled. Yeah. So the beer was a quick, quick brewed beer made to be uh, 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 croissant and uh, uh, put into uh, what were called uh, six hoopers. These are very incredibly tough kegs with iron bungs so that the uh, incredible uh, volatility of the kegs 
uh, at more or less room temperature. Anybody who's opened a can of beer on the beach knows what I'm talking about. Um, uh, would they would survive? Um, right. And uh, uh, until they made it to the to the bars around town. Uh, delivered by horse and wagon, and then a smart bartender would let those beer, let those kegs rest for a few days. And when he tapped them, um, sometimes, n- nevertheless, uh, they emitted a loud hissing noise and a spray that reminded somebody of a steam engine. Mm-hmm. And that may be one of the story. I go into the different stories and the different theories in the book, um, but all of them uh, are sort of colorful. Uh, uh, apocryphal stories that, too, right? and apocryphal. Like, yeah, 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 I mean yeah. that's you know, um, uh, but uh, apocryphal is good sometimes. Uh, that's uh, so that's that's okay. I used to be very frustrated that there was no one answer to that question, and then I realized <laughs> that that that's kind of what history is all about. You don't always have you know a precise answer to things, and the answer will never really been uh, never be known. Um, in uh, in the early days in the gold rush, the brewers used to just call it lager beer because there was no there was no lager beer there, so they might as well just call it lager because that's what everybody liked. It was the closest but, available but, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but the nickname that cropped up was steam. So the customers were calling it steam, mm-hmm. and eventually, when lager beer brewing became possible um, in uh, uh, 1875, and Beer came down from a little town called Boca up in uh, near Truckee um, on the rail on the railroad. Um, the ice uh, did traditional lager lager beer. Then they uh, uh, they were kind of the brewers were kind of outed that oh wait a minute. Um, so they accepted the the term steam. So you see the term steam cropping up uh, in in written form in around the nineteen or eighteen seventies. Probably yeah. that's a historian's uh, pitfall as you always. Get your centuries wrong. <laughs> I mean, what's a hundred? What's a hundred years amongst friends? What's a hundred years? <laughs> either, either way. So Fritz, so the brewery kind of hobbled along, um, and uh, uh, in uh, 1959, um, uh, the one man in the world who knew how to brew steam beer, Joe Allen. Um, the brewery was, at that time was uh, just a few blocks from where the brewery is today in mm-hmm. Montero Hill at 17th and Kansas. Um, uh, he was 71 years old and he was kind of broken down from hoisting the kegs and doing all the work himself and decided to, to close the to close the brewery. Some of his key accounts, uh, like the Crystal Palace Market in San Francisco, had closed in, in 1959. And uh, uh, others, although they were supportive, like the old spaghetti factory, uh, couldn't couldn't help him keep it keep it running. And he really seemed to have no heir apparent. So uh, an heir apparent did appear. However, his name was Lawrence Steese and not Fritz Maytag. The, the brewery was not saved yet. twice. The <laughs> brewery was saved twice. It was saved uh, in, in 1959 by Lawrence Steese and a secret investor, a secret angel, which is always a good idea when you have financial troubles, <laughs> uh, named, named Bill Buck. And um, uh, they found another uh, location for the brewery, kept all the equipment and moved it over there. The location was 541 8th Street between Brandon and Bryant. And coincidentally, that's the location where Fritz started with the brewery um, Mm. a a few years later. Uh, Bill Buck got a little angry because the... uh, 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 by increments of ten thousand uh, dollars, the debts started to accumulate uh, for the brewery, and uh, the the beer began to get uh, not a particularly great uh, reputation for quality. Uh, so he got out, and two other guys came in: um, Barney Blake and Niels Mortensen, who were ad ad agency guys, and they kicked in for the same fifty one percent that Bill Buck had owned. Of, of the brewery. And uh, then they got cold feet because they were starting to get more attention for their advertising firm. And the last thing they wanted to to see in the San Francisco Chronicle was an article about uh, these ad guys, uh, you know, who blew it and made a terrible investment. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. uh, so, so they, they were pulling out and that was re- the real reason why uh, in addition to the fact that uh, uh the Steese's beer was, uh, you know, as as you, 
as you start to run out of money, you start to cut corners. You start to do crazy things, you sure, know. And sure. uh, uh, and the beer had the beer as well as the brewery had had really fallen on hard times. So um, uh, Fritz, uh, uh, to get him into this into the story here. Uh, well, if, before if I should continue, yeah, you may. Yeah, have, yeah oh my go gosh, ahead. the thank you for the run up here. That is more context than I think most of our audience could ever hope to have gotten anywhere else. So that was. Uh, fantastic to, to sort of set the scene before we introduce, uh, uh, who I think could accurately be called the, the hero of this next uh, yeah. part of the story. Um, you mentioned sort of the quality of the beer. And I think that's like these days, like anchor steam is, I mean, steam beer is synonymous with anchor. I think to the extent that anyone really understands that there's steam beer beyond the anchor brewing company, it's mostly, craft brewing enthusiasts or beer historians. But I mean, for most rank and file American drinkers, steam beer is, is, is the anchor thing and it's a premium product. And people think of it as a malty full flavored beer. I like it personally. We drink the, obviously the Christmas ale as well, whenever it comes out, but steam beer is, 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 you know, iconic and, and as much a part of the the history as, as Fritz is himself or even more so. But in this period, you know, as we sort of approach midway through the 20th century um, and, and, you know, the, the following decade, um, you mentioned that the, the beer itself had, you know, the brewery was struggling to sort of put out a consistent product. And I was hoping you could, because I think this is really important to understand what Fritz Maytag was buying when he bought the brewery. Can you describe a little bit about like sort of some of the challenges they were having and, and, you know, what the, how the beer was thought of contemporarily at, you know, at that moment in the late fifties, early sixties? Yeah. Well, by, and by way of contrast, I would say, I want to ask you a question. Uh, when you think of the name Maytag, uh, Fritz Maytag's great grandfather founded the Maytag company that's known for its washers and dryers and even my refrigerator and here in the house. Mine too. Uh, actually. So, uh, yeah. so what, what are two words that come to mind? I'm putting you on the spot here, but, uh, what are, when, when you think of Maytag, all right. Well, I'm going to try to take my uh, beer journalism hat off and just speak as a consumer. I would certainly, I would have to say appliances. So I'm going with reliability and uh, I'm going to go with, um, you know, like dynasty. Maybe I want to say, I'm not exactly sure where you're headed with this, but I hope I gave you enough fodder to make your point. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, reputation sure. and qual and quality. And so, ironically, and Fritz didn't realize it till later, um, uh, he actually took a lot more from his family and from the family business than he thought he did when he when he ended up, uh, you know, kind of coming coming on the scene. Um, but when you say uh, that they tried to make consistent beer, that even wasn't as much on the radar as you might think back in those days. <laughs> oh boy. They were just having, having a, they were having a good time making, making the beer and it, you know, and the beer would go into a keg. And in those days it was uh, still wooden barrels mm -hmm. um, because the owner thought that they had a great charm, even though they're, they're a great um, harbor for all kinds of bacteria and spoilage and everything else. Um, so, uh, I mean, he did an amazing job saving the company, keeping it going, getting attention for for the for the brewery and so on. Um, but not even the word consistent, you know, uh, was a was a goal. The beer went out the door, you know, regardless of how it, pretty much <laughs> right, of how right. it, of how it turned out. So it was incredibly incon inconsistent. Um, he had some loyal supporters, um, uh, the same type of person that. Uh, supports would have supported the anachronistic cable car. You know, uh, there was a time when the cable cars in San Francisco almost disappeared. And, really? you know, and a lot of people rallied, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and here they are still today, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and uh, uh, oddly enough, I've always, I've always speculated that if, if Fritz had heard that the last cable car barn was closing, I bet he would have gone to that too. You know, in other words, but for the but for the fact that it was beer, you know, he would have he would have gone he would have gone and taken <laughs> taken care of that. I love so, that um, idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so there were there were a lot of shortcuts and there were a lot of bad fi bad financial moves. So one of the things that Lawrence Steese did in 1964. 
uh, because he needed to generate cash besides selling those wooden barrels out front of the brewery. Um, uh, when Fritz showed up uh, the first time, they were uh, they were available for seventy five cents, uh, spigot not included, and uh, um, so he ended up uh, raising the price of a keg. A uh, keg is thirty. Uh, a barrel is thirty one gallons. A keg in those days uh, was fifteen and a half gallons. Mm. That's technically a half barrel, and so from fifteen dollars to twenty dollars. Um, thinking, well, the, gee, that's going to generate a lot more income. Well, what it did was uh, it generated a whole bunch of sales uh, before the price went up. So, because he announced, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he announced, you know, next week, by the way, I'm raising the price to 20 bucks. Sure. So, so sales went through the roof, you know, but what happened was you had, a that's like, that's like the equivalent of saying, hey, I'm going to uh, raise the price on milk next week. You know, from uh, five dollars to to ten dollars, you right. know, uh, a gallon. Everybody's uh, guess buying what? milk this Everybody's week. Everybody's buying milk, <laughs> but guess what happens to the milk after you know after a, after a week or two? It's it all bad, spoiled, of course. Yeah. So so uh, so the kegs were out there, but people stopped buying. So nobody really bought kegs at at twenty dollars mm. uh, a keg. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. The, and, and he, yeah. No, oh, just like the inverse relationship between price and volume, obviously, is one of the sort of golden rules of the beer industry. But another golden rule is that uh, it's a fresh product. It's an agricultural yeah. product. It has a shelf life, even more so than even more so in wooden barrels than in, uh, you know, in the in the, the metal uh, kegs that are in plastic kegs that are preferred nowadays by, by most brewers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he kind of backed himself into a corner there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, though it was, uh, though it was filtered. It was, let's just call it lightly filtered. It was unpasteurized. So, mm. so, uh, so then the, so then the reputation part of the equation go, starts to go down. He wound up at the end of 1964 with just 128 bucks in the bank. Whoa. And, uh, uh, so it was, it was definitely, uh, definitely a desperate, desperate times. And, um, um, and and he had taken you know all kinds of uh, corners. Uh, Fritz even, uh, I think I know from having talked to him a lot. But Fritz wouldn't even tell me some of the things that he put in the beer. <laughs> this is <laughs> to, you know just just to, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. additives yeah. and preservatives and you know all kinds of all kinds of things. Uh, and of course malt malt syrup, uh, corn syrup, sucrose, sure. uh, sugar, you know anything that was cheaper than uh, than malt. Um, sure. and coloring because it was difficult to, uh, buy in those days, everything was about light beer. So it was difficult even for, even for anybody to, uh, buy a caramel malt or darker malts. Uh, and so, so why not just throw the coloring in there? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to make a porter just, uh, or essentially a dark steam, there was steam beer light and steam beer dark in those days. Why not just throw more coloring in? And uh, <laughs> uh, that's the only, literally the only difference. And wow. at the old spaghetti factory where Fritz used to go for a beer, he always was partial to the steam beer light. It doesn't mean that it's lighter than steam beer. It means that it's just anchor steam beer yeah, yeah. as opposed to, as opposed to the dark. He had no idea that the only difference was the amount of coloring that was put directly in the keg. It wasn't a brewing thing wow. directly in the keg before it went out. So, so you could just imagine, but there's a tremendous charm to all this, which is, which is really wonderful. And what Fritz saw when he went there, he saw, a, you know, a San Francisco product, um, uh, known for, uh, known for being a part of San Francisco's history and, and folklore for all those years that had fallen on hard times, you know, and he's kind of the Warren Buffett of, uh, uh, alcoholic beverages, you know, mm. if you think about as wine and whiskey and gin and, and as well as the beer and just figured that that was worth trying to get it back on its, get its back on its feet. Um, so Fritz was living in, he had dropped out of Stanford. He was a, a Japanese studies uh, major there at Stanford and grad school and, uh, had dropped out, was living on Russian Hill, coincidentally on Green Street and, uh, uh, just up the street from, uh, uh the old spaghetti factory, um, uh, which had been founded by Fred Koo, uh, in, uh, on, 
October 19th, uh, 1956. And uh, Fred had come to San Francisco in the early 18... Uh, see, there I go again, the early 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I kind of bounce around Not uh, at all. Uh, with the centuries. In the early 1950s, uh, and the friend that picked him up at the airport drove him directly to the Crystal Palace market in San Francisco. Uh, it was on 8th Street between Market and Mission. And in the back was uh, a glorious little place called the Steam Beer Parlor, where you could buy a glass of steam beer, or you could buy a glass of Christian Brothers brandy. You could buy a hot dog. You could buy a whole chicken, uh, not roasted, but ready to take <laughs> home. Okay, it was part of this amazing sort of covered farmer's market, you know, uh, thing in San Francisco. And that was one of the things that it closed in, in 19, in 1959. And one, and one of the key, it was one of the, you know, was one of the key accounts, but his friend, Fred's, uh, buddy took him right there. He had a steam beer there and he vowed that he would come back to San Francisco, open a restaurant and serve only steam beer. And, uh, he did come back and, uh, 1954, uh, worked as a bartender and uh, uh, waiter at the Purple Onion in San Francisco, and then opened the old spaghetti factory in 1956. And it made that vow come true because for all those years, although there was bottled beer, there were other bottled beers, um, Anchor Steam Beer was the only beer on draft. Mm. And all these sales guys would come in, you know, from Miller and Coors bud and said you're crazy you know it cost too much and it's you're not gonna you're gonna sell more beer if you buy and he said no sorry that's it you know and uh take a hike buddy and yeah. so um uh, so anyway um so fritz um used to go in go in for a go in for a beer uh the spaghetti wasn't the the favorite thing to order among the regulars there. Let's just put it that way. What was the, uh, well, I mean, the old spaghetti the, factory? <laughs> it wasn't the apparently the world. It wasn't the world's best spaghetti, but yeah, it was yeah. the best conversation. It was what Ray Oldenburg calls a great, a great good place. You know where where people would just hang out, and it was this bohemian thing with chairs hanging from the ceiling and all kinds of crazy art and rock and roll posters, um, and. Um, uh, Fritz just liked it, you know. It was his local. It was his his great good place, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Fred knew him pretty well by then, and knew that what I know about Fritz today is that Fritz is probably more than anybody else I've ever known in my life as uh, this insatiable curiosity. And so, as he was as he was pouring Fritz a beer on August first, nineteen sixty five. He said, he said, Fritz, you know, that the brewery that makes this beer is, is going out of business and uh, they, they could close. They could close, in, you know, this week and you got to get you got to get down there and see it, you know, before it goes goes under. And so sure enough, the next morning, Fritz hopped into his uh, Smyrna Green Porsche and drove from Russian Hill down to uh, down to 8th Street to see what by then had become Lawrence Stesis Brewery. He and Joe Allen worked side by side as they made a transition. That's one of the, one of the wonderful things about the history of the brewery is there's always a transition. Mm -hmm. So there's always a traditions and things that carry on. It's never like it just stops right. and, then, and then restarts, uh, even from before and after Prohibition. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so he met uh, Lawrence Stees and uh, – uh, they hit it off. They uh, he had, and he certainly admired what Steves had done, and uh, Steves gave him a tour of the brewery, and he said, uh, "I'm desperate. I need you know. I need help. And are you willing to are you willing to help?" And so he bought. I talked about Blake and Morton since fifty one percent. So right. what Fritz did was buy their fifty one percent share. A share was a hundred dollars. So Fritz bought. 51% of the brewery for $5,100. Now that sounds ridiculous, uh, but uh, even that day he had to loan, also loan Lawrence Steese uh, about $9,200 mm -hmm. um, to pay the bills. Things were, times were really, really, really tough. Dire. And yeah. it took, yeah, it took, uh, it took Fritz uh, 10 years to turn the brewery around. To, to finish Steese's story, so, uh, so Steese, uh, Fritz tended to be the, uh, kind of secret behind the scenes angel for a while. And that was his only intention really was to just help 
help somebody out, you know, that needed help. Um, but, uh, uh, and that was uh, August 2nd, 1965. Um, Fritz was involved in other projects, doing other things. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is that he, uh, is he decided when he was in Chicago a few months later that he would go to the Brewers Association of America uh, conference. That's at, right. Edgewater they had a conference, Beach, right? Edge, well, there, Edge, yeah. Edgewater Beach Hotel. Yeah. And, um, uh, but he was too embarrassed to sign up for it. And he snuck in the back door uh, and, uh, and witnessed that and saw, saw what it was like to be a member of the brewing trade. And that's what kind of started a, a spark besides just seeing the brewery itself and being around the brewery. He had had a I don't know if you remember the Gilbert chemistry sets. He had had a Gilbert chemistry set when he was a boy. And mm. so, and he was in a great place to learn all the sciences. As a matter of fact, many of the sciences that we study today come out of brewers and breweries and things that problems that they encountered and things, things they tried to fix. So, uh, if that helps tell you a little bit about the, uh, uh, about this, about the story there, um, you know, it's, it was, it was fascinating and it didn't follow like a lot of the, these stories, it didn't follow the just kind of conventional path. The other thing I'd like to remind, I'm sure, you know, but uh, maybe not all of your audience knows. Uh, there's a reason why I put a picture of Fritz in the book, riding his 1958 BSA motorcycle. motorcycle yeah, yeah. Because he looks like some, combination of James Dean meets Steve McQueen on that thing. It's <laughs> right, hilarious. Right. But it reminds people that he was only 27 at the time when all this happened. Whoa. People people tend to think of him as somebody that's on the sort of the, the brewery dollar bill or the or right. Mount Rushmore or some, you know, they think of him, you know, uh, he's 85 t today, very healthy and and uh, incredibly, sh incredibly sharp. Um, I see him once a month. We get our haircut. As you can see, my nice haircut here. We get our haircut. Uh, we get our haircut together, and then go for our haircut lunch every month. We've been doing it for twenty, twenty-five years. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so uh, I think it's important that people remember that this is a young guy's. This is a young guy's story. And uh, uh, I think that's really, really, really important. And when he, yeah, thank you for the reminder, man, that is so, I mean, we think of, of course, now it's a lot more uh, uh, usual for um, young brewers to get into the business with investors and whatever. But at that time, this was a family business that was handed down for, you know, from uh, one German American generation to the next, for the most part across the country for Fritz to just kind of parachute in, find himself at a, at the old spaghetti factory and find out that his favorite beer was, um, was on the, you know, was on thin ice, so to speak. And the brewer was about to go into the business and then just go ahead and, and throw himself into it at 27 is a much different, uh, much different story, man. That's, that's quite a, quite a leap of faith that he took. Yeah. Yeah. He'd had the beer, uh, for the first time at the Oasis in Menlo park, which mm -hmm. was a great, Great bar it closed. It, uh, it closed a couple of couple of years ago, and um, um, it's uh, and he, his memory of it was that it, eh, it was a little off. It wasn't so great. Well, that was 1959, coincidentally, right around the time that uh, the the brewery was getting ready to close, mm -hmm. and then there was no more no more Anchor Steam there um, until Fritz went in in October after coming back from that. Brewers Association of America convention. He got a he got a business card printed up with his name as president of Anchor. And when then it was called Steam Beer Brewing Company. That's a whole other story. But anyway, he uh, went down to the Oasis and uh, uh, sold it back in to the Oasis. So then o the Oasis, because from 1959 to 1965 they had not had the beer. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, but as he got into the as he got into the market there and and saw people and talked to people and talked to bar owners, he realized that the beer that he was selling really just was incredibly inconsistent and wasn't so good. It needed and a key work, moment. Yeah. yeah, a key moment for him came early on, um, uh, and um, uh, where he had he was having a party at the brewery, he tried to bring a lot of people into the brewery, to, just like we do today. Yeah, and he uh, um, he went out to as as any 
respectable uh, president and brewmaster would do and and poured, poured a glass of beer, you know, and it was sour. And then he poured another, there was another tap. He poured another, there was only anchor steam there mm. uh, and it was sour. And then he went up, hooked up some more kegs and there wasn't a single good keg of anchor steam beer in the brewery. This is at the brewery um, itself. I mean, the at place- the brewery itself where you would think it would, I mean, don't we, don't we have something that was just racked, you know, in right. a keg the day right. before? No. So anyway, so he's, he got, he freaked out. And I mean, the party was literally just a couple of hours away. So he started driving around San Francisco and he realized that everywhere he went, he's, you know, he said, I just, just check in, you know, having a beer. He tried to low key it, you know, he didn't want everybody to send the beer back. Sure. So, uh, and then he finally went down when I, when the book went to publication, I, Fritz and I still hadn't figured out where it was that he went, where the beer was good. And uh, we finally brainstormed one day uh, with freshly cut hair and a, and a glass of coffee in our hands. And it was Artichoke Joe's down in San Bruno, which was a long time. A famous, account, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, famous yeah. casino. Famous, you know? right, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and then, so that's where, the, that's where the only fresh cakes of beer. So he bought them back. You know, from Artichoke Joe's, and frantically drove them up drove to, them back to the uh, drove them back to the brewery. You know, to his own brewery. You know, to proudly pour them. And so, at that point, he realized he needed to work on. He also realized that, uh, and he he had bought in 1966. Uh, he had bought. Uh, he had almost bought Lawrence Tees out. He owned ninety. Fritz owned ninety nine percent of the brewery. And then in 1969, he bought Steese out. Um, so Fritz figured, okay, look, I got to learn. I got to really learn how to brew. And uh, one of the first things he did was he brought a shower curtain into the brewery and hung it to wall to essentially shower curtain or wall off a part of the brewery to be his lab. And he also brought in a hand colored engraving of Louis Pasteur hung it up there and he brought in his microscope, which he had had since he was a boy of 15 so that he could look. And he, he jokes, he says, you know, if you see bacteria in your beer, it's already too late. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> you're already in trouble. There's no, but he saw a lot of uh, wee beasties as he called them um, <laughs> in the, in the beer uh, and um, uh, or animal cules as, as, uh, um, as, 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 uh, Anthony uh, van Leeuwenhoek. I just got back from Holland. So I went to see both Johannes Vermeer and his neighbor uh, Leeuwenhoek's uh, graves uh, and uh, uh, stayed in their town of Delft uh, in, in Holland, which was fascinating. And so uh, uh, in some ways, he was the father of microscopy. And so, yeah. so and Fritz was following in those, in those footsteps. So then he started to go on the, on the brew with Steese. And that was tricky, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint. Steese was the brewmaster, you know, thought of himself as the brewmaster, even though Fritz was technically brewmaster and president. And, um, uh, but Fritz handled it really well. And you see in his notes, you see it's always, he always talks in the third person in his notes. We, we did this, we did that, we did Mm, that, mm. you know, and so, and so on. So he could be hands on in every step of the process. Um, Um, in the in the book, you refer to Fritz by this like great, I think, tag or, or moniker, the gentleman brewer. And I was hoping mm-hmm. that we could talk because this is where he, Fritz kind of, you know, as he takes uh, uh, majority control and then de facto complete control and then actually complete control in 1969, um, he finds that he's got a bigger challenge on his hands than simply, you know, going out and selling uh, more beer, right? He's got to actually go back to first principles and figure out, um, you know, how to make this beer more consistent, how to make it live up to everything he loves about it. Right. And, um, you had this line, um, in the book that I thought we could talk about. I was hoping to, to unpack a little bit that, um, the rest of the, uh, or many in the, in the beer establishment, perhaps some of those guys that he saw in Chicago when he snuck into the Brewers Association conference sort of thought of him as a quote, Don Quixote, uh, tilting at malt mills, which I, <laughs> I love, I love that line. And I, I think I, I, yeah, I made that up. I, or actually, I think I dreamt that and then got up in the night and wrote it down. But, but it's anyway, a good it's, one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really true. They just thought he was kind of crazy. And yeah. the fact that he was from San Francisco in the sixties 
everybody's, well, of course he's crazy, right. you know? And, uh, um, I mean, here's a guy that would, uh, to get attention, he tried anything he could do to get attention to sell beer. He, he, uh, he put a bunch of hops in a clear plastic bag and put it on the passenger seat of his, uh, Porsche ragtop and drove all around the city for weeks, you know, with this, what looked very suspicious, uh, bag of green stuff yeah. on the, on the passenger seat. And, uh, I said, yeah, I asked him, I said, so, so what happened? And he says, well, I realized nobody can get arrested in San Francisco in the 1960s. <laughs> so <laughs> not even with a bag of something that looked like, not even with yeah. bag of, so, exactly. So, so, uh, um, but I think that that's, uh, also, I think that he had a tremendous, he, he talks about entrepreneurship in an uh, interesting sense is that, because I ask him, you know, what, what do entrepreneurs want? Do you, do you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, and that's, it's, if you think about entrepreneurs, you know, I'm sure you know a few, I know a couple, what do they want? And he says, it's just to be proven right. They just want to be proven right. Mm. And I think he applied that and also a tremendous fear of failure. I mean, he was a Maytag after all. And then even though he'd been in, uh, essentially by his father and mother spared the uh, burden after his father had died of coming in and running the company. Um, and uh, that was a remarkable gift that freed Fritz up to do other things and uh, and not be as burdened as his father was with the company because Fritz's grandfather had also died died young and Fritz's father had taken over um, uh, when uh, when Fritz was very young and when when uh, when Fritz's father was very young. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so I think I think that that. That has a lot to do with it, that that absolute de determination, uh, but with a tremendous optimism and a tremendous enthusiasm. My favorite st story that I found, you know, I didn't really know what the threads would be when I started writing the book. You know, what's going to follow through from beginning to end? What's going to be the real theme of the book? I didn't I didn't want to try to think it up and then write to the theme. Sure. I wanted to discover the theme as I wrote. And... Um, there was a great guy that worked for Lucky Lager. He was a brewmaster at Lucky Lager uh, that Fritz used to get uh, yeast from. He used to go around from from brewery to brewery once a month. He only brewed once a month at the beginning, wow. and and get yeast, you know. And uh, uh, he figured if he just saw them twice a year, they wouldn't really be. They, you know, they would. Again, this is the tilting at windmills. They just said, "Oh, here's the crazy guy from from <laughs> Anchor right, again," you know, right. looking for more yeast, and. Uh, uh, so anyway, um, uh, he met this guy, Otto Wiesneth, who was from a little town in, in Germany called Elkmann. And I was able to track down his his family brewery's history. And he came over, became a Marine, uh, immigrated to the U.S., became a Marine, and ended up uh, uh, working for Lucky Lager. And Fritz was having terrible problems with the equipment as well as with the ingredients for the beer. And so uh, uh, so he said, I'm having problems with this combo uh, mash ton, louder ton, and I'm getting this thick congealed, you know, mass of mash in here. I can't move it out, mm. you know, and it's deep, you know, it's up to your waist. And so uh, Otto came over and looked at it. And uh, the first thing he did was just jump in. <laughs> now Fitz had jumped in the in the mash tun a few times, but he, but poor Otto didn't really know how deep it was. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, and he just admired that tremendous enthusiasm. And then ultimately, Otto helped uh, showed him the uh, sieve shaker that that they had at the brewery, which allows you to check the. The, the malt. Um, and then Fritz ended up getting one. You'll see it in a couple of pictures in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the gentleman brewer was an interesting thing because you see in most of the pictures, he's either, either wearing white coveralls or he's wearing a white shirt and a tie, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, so he was, uh, but he was a very, uh, and I certainly knew him as an incredibly hands-on uh, owner. And he was the type of brewmaster that wasn't just a brewmaster in an office. And in the, in today's brewery, his, uh, you know, his, his, uh, office was built to look out directly on the, uh, 
on the brew house. Yeah. Um, so he wasn't off somewhere. Which is, of course, very familiar when we think about what the craft beer industry has long since morphed into where, um, you know, it's much more common for co-founders of breweries to be, as we talked about before, to be young. It's much more common for them to be technical founders where they're hands-on, they're actual brewmasters. But at the time, and this is something I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, as we, as we talk about this, like, pivotal period uh, for Anchor, at the time, that was not the case. There was no sort of, like, um, um, commercial precedent for that, or very few in terms of where the momentum was in the American beer industry at that time. This was the era of uh, regional consolidation. Um, this was the era of um, Schlitz and Anheuser Busch were sort of the heavyweights in a slugfest to see who could build, you know, the most breweries all across the country where they could roll out a commodified product that was, you know, sort of marketed with all of the the leading edge principles of of what we now call consumer packaged good marketing, right? Like this was this was not the trend at the time. I mean, I think it's important to remember too, as you've mentioned variously over the course of our conversation, like uh, Fritz was just sort of cutting against the current of really, really powerful market forces at this time as he started, you know, thinking about beer as this special, you know, talking about beer as a specialized product, talking about as a local product, talking like these were not things that were dominant and, and, um, sort of uh, in the in the ether in the same way that they they have they have since become my question for you Dave is did you in your research and talking to Fritz after all these years like was there ever a thought of trying to turn anchor into like a you know a, a Stroh's or a, a, a you know like a, a big regional sort of like commodity player rather than the direction that he took the brewery I mean it seems like he, had this vision that he just sort of understood innately, but I'm curious if he ever had any, any impulse to, to go another way with it. Well, that's really uh, insightful, Dave. That's great. And um, um, I think that Fritz, of course, Fritz was always wanting to go against the grain, mm -hmm. no, pun, <laughs> no pun intended. And, uh, uh, or in his case, against the lack of grain <laughs> in, the, right. in, the, in, the, in, in the beer. He was a big advocate of all malt, brews. But um, um, I think in those days, you know, in the 60s, particularly, you saw and he went to a, dozens of auctions, brewery auctions, you know, when these breweries, these local breweries are going out of business. Mm. It was so sad, you know, and uh, his favorite one that he uh, he went to had they had cleaned up. They hadn't just, you know, the last whistle blows and they all just leave, you know, like rats deserting the sinking ship. And it was clean and shiny and and beautiful, and uh, that was the Erie Erie uh, Brewing Company, and um, uh, you know, but and he ended up buying a lot of that used, you know, that used equipment from you know from those breweries, but always with a little bit of a little bit of a tear in his eye. Sure. Um, in those in that case, that you're right, there was a tremendous amount of consolidation, and the big breweries. Were also doing a heck of a lot of TV advertising. Sure, and what they were doing is they were do, doing t buying TV time advertising time in local markets. So where you would have a local brewery, and suddenly uh, you know a uh, uh, you know a, a, there's Budweiser ads, uh, you know uh, you know all over. Um, I grew up in Chicago. There's the Hams, you know the Hams yep. Hams ads. Yeah, uh, they're they're taking over. So, uh, um, so he kind of went the other way. He took the local brewery into the for anchor into the first national craft brand. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, he took it the other the other direction, um, uh, but always celebrating the fact that it was made in in San Francisco and a Japanese principle of maibutsu, which is uh, called the fame the fame thing. The idea that uh, well, for example, if you come to San Francisco, maybe you're going to bring uh, some sourdough bread back to your buddy, sure. you know, in Chicago or Cleveland or New York. Um, and uh, so he wanted uh, uh, Anchor Steam Beer to, to be that same sort of that same sort of prod, uh, product. When when Dave did he, 
you know, we talked about sort of this transitionary period, early 60s, 1965, he acquires 51%. By 1969, he's got 100% of the brewery. At what point does it stabilize for him? At what point does Fritz realize, oh. like, oh, okay, maybe this thing is going to work? <laughs> Well, uh, that actually fast forwards way, way into the next decade. <laughs> That's 1975. But I think, I think that the, uh, the key decision that he made was in 1967. And that was to bottle, to bottle beer. Sure, I, yeah, I brought sure. along just for fun the first, the very first four pack. Wow. Of Anchor Steam from April 23rd, 1971. And uh, he decided in 67 that he needed to do that. And he knew that the market had really changed in terms of draft versus canned or bottled. And uh, so, for example, in 1935, not long after repeal, um, uh, the ratio was uh, 30% in America was 30% canned or bottled to 70%. I brought a an old anchor tap handle to, to, <laughs> this is our cool. faucet here. Um, and to remind me to tell you this. And uh, uh, so 30% bottled or canned, 70% draft uh-huh. in 1935. In 1970, which was coincidentally the year before uh, he began bottling anchor steam for the second time in its, in its history. And uh, uh, that had flopped and it flopped a lot so that there was, Eighty-six percent of the market in the United States was bottled or canned, sure, and fourteen percent was was draft. So the market had just um, run away from it, Anchor's preferred method of getting product to market. I mean, this, exactly. the writing was on the wall there. Yeah. So yeah. he had to he had to bottle, uh, and he was also getting a lot of resistance. Uh, most bartenders would say, "Oh, fine, you know, I'm okay. I got Guinness, I got Heineken, but I don't really need." Any any draft, you know, uh, it, you know, any draft, any more draft beers, sure, you know, um, especially not a domestic draft. What's well, a, I can get a higher exactly. price for Heineken or for Guinness. Not a domestic. No one's going to pay the premium on, or is not as Absol- willing to. Absolutely. Yeah. So so it was really sixty seven, and by that time he'd already studied. I brought my De Klerk books here to to uh, to show. <laughs> I love you. all the props, Dave. This is he, great. oh yeah, oh yeah. He'd already. Uh, uh, you know, bought his version of this of this Bible. It's really the Brewer's Bible. Yeah. And uh, Volume One uh, tells you how to brew, and Volume Two tells you how to learn from your mistakes. I guess. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so, anyway, uh, and he he really studied every aspect, every ingredient that he put in the beer, uh, and how much he put in. And what it was, so he took the brewery from Cluster Hops to uh, to uh, Northern Brewer, for example. Um, he took the uh, uh, beer from uh, uh, all pale malt with coloring uh, to pale malt plus uh, caramel malt. Um, he tried uh, dozens of different yeasts to try to find out, find one strain that he he ultimately, and what nobody to this day, including Fritz, really knows exactly, you know, you can't pinpoint it. The very first uh, bottling, he actually, for this, he decided not to take a chance and not go to the nearest uh, local uh, brewery for the yeast mm. um, or use brewer's yeast. He tried brewer's yeast as well. Um, but to um, uh, to contact Wallerstein, which was the big lab, um, and get some pure culture yeast uh, for that. But then sure enough, the second, second bottling, uh, it was on to another, another yeast. So yeah, all, yeah. everything was being experimented with. And then Burton salts also, you know, to harden the water. This, we had, uh, get wonderful water here in San Francisco from Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Um, but uh, to this day, we add a little bit of calcium, calcium sulfate or gypsum to it. So the question was, when do you add it? And how much do you add? And so on. So um, I remember the for the recipe for this for this beer. Uh, it was a fifty five barrel uh, system. Was twenty four fifty pounds of uh, pale malt, uh, just uh, fifty pounds of uh, caramel malt. Uh, he actually then doubled it after that, um, and uh, uh, forty four pounds of hops. No dry hopping, of course, for for Anchor Steam. Right, um, and uh, and eight pounds of uh, Burton salts. And then what's fun is to go through the brew charts and see how it continued to evolve. So it wasn't like he did it, we bottled, and that was it. Mm-hmm. 
that was it on the way to a process. Another Japanese term, Kaizen, which is the concept of continuous improvement. And that was something that Fritz had somehow mysteriously absorbed from maybe his Japanese studies or from the Maytag from the Maytag way, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, of his, of his great grandfather. So he did that with the ingredients. And then at the same time, uh, particularly with the addition of Gordon McDermott to the staff in 1968, he finally had somebody that he could just say, okay, I, I need a new wall over there. Uh, or I need, we need a hot word tank, you know, here's how it looks. Can you build it? Um, and Gordon would say, okay, I built it. What do you, what's next? You know, and right. it was just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, uh, Fritz calls Gordon his rock. Um, and, uh, uh, for good reason, there were two other rocks that came later. Uh, uh, Mark Carpenter, of course, in September, uh, 1971. And then, uh, Linda Rowe, our office manager, uh, who came in 74, just a week after we started bottling Porter. So he, if you go through every piece of equipment, I talked to you about the combo mash ton, louder ton. Uh, if we go back up a step to the, to the brew kettle, uh, when Fritz, Fritz wondered why the brews and the boils were inconsistent. And, um, the only way I can describe this is, uh, uh, well, he suddenly realized that hey, there were there were no doors on the on the on the brew kettle. And if you look at pictures of Joe Allen and Lawrence Steese uh, brewing, you'll see no doors on the kettle. Well, imagine if you worked for a four star restaurant or you bought a four star restaurant and you walked in and you said, "Well, I think I'll cook a little something for dinner here in the kitchen." And you go, "There's not a single." cover for any of the saucepans in <laughs> in the restaurant okay do you know what i mean what's the deal with that yeah, so he yeah. got fred's after a wonderful copper smith to to take care of that and then he got rid of the cool ship the cool ship was officially retired in 1968 believe it or not that cool those cool ships had been in use all that time whoa the brewery was always uh you know a traditional beer made with uh throwback you know, uh, uh, technology. Yeah. And when Fritz walked one day into the cool ship room, which had, you know, shuttered, you know, shuttered windows there. Um, uh, and, and, uh, actually he walked in because he heard pigeons cooing, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he went in and I don't need to tell you, uh, any, even one of the reasons that he would say, okay, it's time to get yeah, rid of this cool yeah. ship. So he got what, what was called a short time, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so we got what was called the short time, which is basically a heat exchanger that we use today to cool, cool the, the wort, uh, rapidly down. It's, it's as the clerk would, would tell you, um, the beer is at its most vulnerable the minute it leaves the brew house and starts getting cooled. And, uh, you need to get it from that point to the point where you've added the yeast to it, you know, and then, uh, and then done whatever you did to, to bottle it. And he also changed the way that, and experimented with the way that the beer was, um, uh, f filtered, uh, the way that, uh, ultimately buying a centrifuge, uh, diatomaceous earth and a plate and frame uh, filter uh, and a, uh, a heat exchanger uh, there for flash pasteurization. So all of these things were happening at the same time he was buying uh, used bottling bottling equipment yeah. and trying to have Gordon help him assemble uh, the bottling line. And miraculously and amazingly, it all came together, uh, including a beautiful old uh, beautiful old label. Drawn uh, uh, by Fritz uh, and then uh, helped uh, by a guy named Bill Hyde, uh, who was our designer before Jim Stitt, who did most of the other labels since. And Bill Hyde's idea was to take – Fritz had just had the words Anchor Steam Beer running across here. Mm -hmm. And Bill Hyde's great design idea was to come up with the idea of a banner, kind of a red banner there. He also created the modeled sort of gold rushy background. Um, and, but he couldn't draw hops. And I don't know if you could say, I'm going to move this in like a yeah, uh, yeah. 3d theater there. Those are grapes. Those aren't hops. Those are grapes. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I've ever noticed that yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> and now of course he ultimately changed it. Once Jim Stitt was the artist, yeah, he, yeah. He had, Jim Stitt knew how to draw hops. Um, but, uh, but actually he kind of enjoyed that. And this was a part of another uh, Japanese word called wabi-sabi, the idea of uh, the celebration of imperfection. Uh, 
um, the enjoyment of imperfection. Uh, it also had a really nice sort of 60s funky funky look. It wasn't supposed to be like the the uh, crisp, well, like like these here. Uh, these are some other examples from the 60s. You know, they, these kind of shiny sure. You know, shiny things. There's a there's an Olympia. Olympia you see our yeah, bottle, yeah. our bottle there, but but uh, with a very different kind of label on it. So there's a, was a real counterculture uh, effect effect there. So all these things came to a head at a very pivotal moment, and then in 1971, we didn't start bottling till April. Mm. A third of the beer that we made in 1971 was bottled rather than kegged, and. Uh, uh, our sales jumped from about uh, twelve. Uh, let's see, I, I can tell you because I got. I want to. I want to be accurate here, so I'm going to be uh, a little silly. But uh, from twelve hundred and sixty-four barrels to two thousand and twenty-seven barrels, just in that one year. Wow! And then, and then the following year, it doubled. So this started us on the path towards having to buy a brewery. You know, mm-hmm. it was one thing to buy buy a bottling line. You know, by by uh, by buying all this equipment. Yeah. But then the bottling line spurred our growth, um, and as well as the other products that Fritz created, uh, such that he really needed to uh, he needed to buy uh, buy a new building, which yeah. he did in 1977, and then started brewing there in 1979. And along the way, as we mentioned at the beginning of this uh, fantastic episode, and we've gone the distance here, so thank you, Dave. But along the way, uh, things started to change at the national level too. We mentioned the uh, the you know Jimmy Carter's uh, signature uh, on the Cranston uh, Act and uh, the legalization of homebrewing at the federal level. There were starting to be green shoots amongst other. Bay Area uh, enthusiasts who are getting, you know, some of this full flavored beer from either from Anchor or from maybe uh, at that point, maybe uh, New Albion or, you know, uh, where they were starting to uh, realize like, man, there could be something here. Maybe I could do something like this. Maybe, maybe this guy Fritz Maytag can teach me a thing or two and then I can do that, you know, in, in my neck of the woods. And, and so this, this momentum that started uh, in 1965, when when Fritz signed on the dotted line, would go on to to have a life of its own, and would eventually spur on um, what we now know as the as the craft brewing movement here in this country. Absolutely, and Fritz was very open source before the term open source even existed. That's so right. He welcomed all comers. You know, it was fun to look at the. Uh, uh, receipt books uh, from selling beer uh, back in the day, and you see people like Ken Grossman and Paul Camusi and and uh, uh, Jack McAuliffe and McAuliffe, other people yeah. that had come through and bought a bought a case of Foghorn or bought a th- this and that, and uh, and it was Fritz who wrote the receipt because that you knew you knew that he was the one that giving them the tour of the the tour of the brewery. Very um, very you know, cool. I thought I thought uh, uh, I thought this morning. As we were think, I was thinking about getting together with you about uh, Fritz's James Beard Awards, mm-hmm. and um, um, to bring this full circle to his whole career, he owned the brewery for forty five years and two days, from August second, nineteen sixty five, to August fourth, uh, twenty ten, and um, I think that the um, he won the outstanding uh, wine and spirits professional award in two thousand three. And he won the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. Now, interestingly, the the outstanding wine and spirits professional doesn't even have the word beer, beer in it. In it. <laughs> and there's a good reason. It's because no beer guy had ever won. Yeah, you know. And uh, and the same thing in the Lifetime Achievement Award. In other words, obviously, it was beer, uh, and the fact that Fritz elevated beer to to a level in this country and inspired so many great brewers uh, that followed him um, such that beer finally had a seat at the table with wine and spirits and good food and slow food and all of these great great things um, and that uh, and to me that's one of his, crowning crowning achievements besides inspiring us all of us who worked for him um, uh, there just couldn't have been a better a better run company or a better boss. I mean, it was just absolutely unbelievable. I never said in my 31 and a half years at Anchor, I never 
kissed my wife goodbye in the morning and told her I was going to work. I always said, I'm, I'm off to the brewery today. I'm headed to the brewery. And that to that, I owe Fritz Maytag and the incredible staff that was there working, working with me, if that makes sense. If, if that makes sense, it's I get shivers just telling you about it because it really was, it really was true. I got to go to work every day at Anchor Brewing. I didn't have to go to work. I got to go to work every day at Anchor Brewing. That's beautiful, Dave. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. Thanks so much for coming on Tap Lines, my friend. You're welcome anytime. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been really nice to chat with you and uh, share uh, share some stories. And uh, uh, I I will save some free beer for you uh, next time you're in San Francisco. <laughs> so give <laughs> me a call. I'll take it. All right. All right. Tap Lines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Farrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, Editor-in-Chief Joanna Sherino, Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Tap Lines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time.